Hello and welcome to Grief Tending. This is a podcast series that aims to support anyone who is in a caregiving role to someone who is grieving. These conversations are seeking to cultivate our collective capacities to be alongside grief in supportive ways. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians on whose unceded lands these interviews are recorded, Turrbal and Yagara peoples, to acknowledge their ongoing connection to land, waters and culture, and to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners. Today's episode sits within the health professional stream of our series and is titled On Grief as a Philosophical Puzzle, Phenomenology and Perception in Bereavement. Our guest for this episode is Matthew Ratcliffe, who is Professor of Philosophy at the University of York in England. His work addresses issues in philosophy of mind, psychology, and psychiatry. Matthew is the author of a number of books, including Feelings of Being, Phenomenology, Psychiatry, and the Sense of Reality, published in 2008, Experiences of Depression, a Study in Phenomenology, from 2015, Real Hallucinations, Psychiatric Illness, Intentionality, and the Interpersonal World, 2017, and most recently in 2022, um, Grief Worlds, a study of emotional experience. In this episode, Matthew Ratcliffe is reflecting on some of the key themes and concepts from his book, Grief Worlds, a study of emotional experience. The book was informed by over 200 surveys of bereaved individuals reflecting on their lived experience of bereavement, um, which then informed the philosophical inquiry um, which Matthew has has um, has laid out in the book. Um, so, one of the things that seems relevant to mention here, um, it echoes Matthew's opening words in the episode. Actually, that the longer he studies or spends time inquiring into the nature of grief, the more he is struck by its utter complexity and multi-layeredness, and how it's not possible to make simple generalizations to try and sum up the entire thing. So similarly, a a key idea in this discussion is that of phenomenology, which uh, I would be the first to say, I also find immensely complex, challenging to define, depending on a particular perspective or place we might be approaching this from. So um, Matthew does discuss some some varying definitions for this during the episode. Um, I thought that it might also be helpful to outline this a kind of summary way that might help contextualize things ahead of the episode as well. So phenomenology is a branch of philosophy which emerged during the 20th century and it seeks rather than trying to to map objective facts um, prior to people's experience you know onto their world it seeks to really value first person subjective experiences and to inquire into the nature of those. So a literal definition could sound something like the study of the way things appear to be to individuals or what it is like to be having an experience um, of awareness or consciousness as a human. Um, And it can be studied through both our physical sensations, um, so our senses, what it is to see, hear, um, touch things, but also our internal worlds, our thoughts, our feelings, emotions, um, our perception, memory, imagination. So these things are all really relevant uh, ways of approaching the question of grief. So I just wanted to to try and invite as many people into that conversation as possible because I realize this can be a complex topic if you're not watching this as a psychiatrist or a psychologist, for example. So when we apply phenomenological approaches to a study of grief, I think one of the things that's really valuable, which is discussed in the episode, is it it is trying to understand grief from the first person perspective of the person who is experiencing grief in all of its varied dimensions without trying to reduce it to one single aspect or to an expert explanation of what's happening or what will happen, for example. So so a discussion on grief from a phenomenological perspective engages with this lived experience 
in all its complexity and all its individuality. And I think when framed in this way, the two, the two sit next to each other with some familiarity. And I think people are more familiar, perhaps, especially if you've listened to a few episodes in this series, to the idea that grief is an immensely complex and multidimensional experience which affects all areas of our lives, thoughts, feelings, emotions, relationships, our social and cultural roles. Um, so this was one of the, the themes actually of the episode where we started was, was the struggle to even speak of grief when the words we may have used to describe difficult or challenging experiences previously seem themselves to have somehow changed or can change as a result of of being in a world where where we are bereaved um, so we, we we come to discuss this idea of the world having a sense of being uncanny you know and the, the literal translation of that from German comes out as something like unhomely so it might be being in a world that that is literally not different in material terms but feels in completely different and unrecognizable. Matthew talks a lot about the way in which this, this altering of the background of what we thought the background of the world or the ground of the world was, how deeply disorienting this can be for someone in grief. And there's a quote from the book that says, instead of looking down to find a smooth monochrome and solid floor beneath our feet, imagine looking down to find a vast and stormy cavern. So those visual um, metaphors, you know, speak speak in quite a, a visceral way to the to the ways in which our our entire perception of the world can shift in grief. So, if you're listening to this, wondering about being a support, um, you know, or caring for someone who who's experiencing grief either before someone dies or if they're recently bereaved. I think phenomenology can be helpful because it gives such an important reminder to us to inquire about an individual's experience without assuming that our own experience would map or be relevant for someone else. And that there are still ways that we can find points of resonance or connection, but it, it could be a very helpful and important thing to start from a place of not assuming we know what someone else might be thinking, feeling, or experiencing. Uh, finally, in the episode, we also talk around the different ways in which people can um, describe or report maintaining a sense of connection with someone who's died. So in grief research literature, um, this idea was, uh, you know, became a lot more popular in the late 20th century with the development of the concept of continuing bonds. Um, from Class and Silverman and others. And this idea of instead of grief being something to get over or move on from, that grieving people actually find uh, a whole range of ways uh, to seek to remain connected to someone who has died. And this may be metaphoric or symbolic for some people. For others, it may be much more sensorial. They feel the presence of the person who has died with them, not in a way that is distressing or haunting, but actually can be very significant and meaningful to their lives. But again, this is something that varies immensely for people in different social, cultural, spiritual contexts. And so I valued the, uh, the framing of that conversation uh, as well. So yeah, I, I hope there's something in this, in this conversation that feels feels supportive and useful to you it certainly is more exploratory and curious in in the in the kind of the rhythm or the flow um, there are more practical um, more directly practical episodes in this series but this is one i think that if you have the space to listen to and wonder about i, I hope that that it might spark in you um, some curiosity about the um, the depth of your own experience or um, what it is to be alongside and supporting other people who are grieving. So, uh, yeah, thank you for listening and uh, enjoy the episode. Hi, welcome, Matthew. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this episode of Grief Tending. 
Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's very nice to talk with you. So I wanted to jump in by, you know, we're going to be talking mostly today around your your book, um, recently published book, Grief Worlds. And um, one of the things that caught my attention in that um, was you, you speak about the way in which grief is a struggle not only for, you know, us to comprehend, particularly people who are grieving, to try and comprehend and, and understand, but also that um, it's a struggle to try and even articulate grief and so given that this podcast series is is um is exploring both of those things um i wanted to ask you to speak around you know that this impact of the loss of language like you, you talk about grief in a broad sense as a loss of possibility but also as a loss of language and you know could you talk about how that's that's experienced by people who are grieving and how that affects affects the world as they try and navigate it uh, yes, I can. I mean, I think the the first thing I should probably say is that the the more I've explored experiences of grief, the more I've come to recognise the sheer complexity and diversity of grief. So, whenever I make generalisations in this interview, I don't mean to suggest that these apply to all people. Uh, grief is experienced in so many different ways, and one one has to be careful here. And this applies specifically to to the topic that you've you've, you've just mentioned. So I think there, there are many different reasons why people might struggle to articulate their grief and to com comprehend their grief. But one of the things I focus on is the manner in which grief is not simply an emotional response to a localised loss that occurs within a wider experiential and social world. One's entire world, one's life structure, one's sense of self, one's relations with others can all be profoundly affected by bereavement, um, you know, everything seems different. And this includes aspects of life that we ordinarily take for granted. We're not called upon them to articulate at all. So one of the things we're tasked with doing is articulating the disturbance of something that usually goes unnoticed, unremarked upon. So it can be difficult to find the language there and indeed to find acknowledgement from others. And there's also a more specific phenomenon I addressed, which is where you say something and as you say it, it seems somehow hollow, wrong, almost paradoxically true and false at the same time. So one example I focus on is a passage from Joyce Carol Oates' uh, autobiographical account of marital bereavement. And she describes driving home from the hospital with her husband's belongings after he's just died. And she's saying, I'm going home with my husband's belongings. How does that even make sense? So you say the word home, you say his belongings. And yes, you know, it, it is one's home. It's one's private residence and not someone else's. But so many of the words we use in everyday life have connotations that are specific to oneself. Home, my home, the place where we live, where we do this, where we sit together, cook together, laugh together, our bed, our sofa, uh, and, and so forth. So when you say these words, in one sense, your, your utterances are true. And yet, in another sense, you can't go home anymore. That sense of home doesn't apply. And, and, and I think this, this can apply more generally as well. There are so many... Um, aspects of our lives that have connotations particular to ourselves. You know, th this park, the park where we used to do this, that school, that town, our parents' house, uh, her room, the place where we used to play. They remain those places, they remain those things in one sense, yet certain possibilities no longer apply. It's not the place where we can do this anymore. And I think people often struggle with the bizarreness of language in these circumstances. Uh, and it's something that is probably still under-theorised and requires a lot more research to really get to grips with. But I think a, a third aspect is connected with uh, both of these themes and with others, which is uh, other people struggle to understand the profundity of the effects of bereavement, the way it unsettles one's whole life one's patterns of thought, one's activities, one's memories, one's hopes, one's dreams, one's imaginings, everything can be thrown into turmoil. 
And there is a tendency to think of bereavement as affecting one in a more localised way. It's extraordinarily painful, but it's something specific that's painful. And, and what's not recognised is the way in which the whole world can be changed. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's such a good distinction between that that localised experience of the feelings and thoughts and emotions that might come along with with an experience of bereavement that someone would have you know, as you're talking, it sort of seems such a, a more vast way of, of conceptualizing or trying to comprehend grief, you know, while you were talking and naming all of those places in someone's world or community. Mm -hmm. I kind of had this image of a, you know, of a map with pins, you know, often on GPSs, it'll drop up, you can drop a pin at your home or your work or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So all of those many, many areas as someone goes through the world, like you said, in driving home with the belongings of someone who's just died, that home has also died in that sense, is no longer there because it was a home that was defined by your relationship with that person who's just died. So the alteration of everything, um, I think, seems seems much more in in play or in context when you describe it in that way. I think that's a very insightful, insightful way of putting it when you refer to a map. So people who've suffered bereavement sometimes remark it's, it's not merely the pain of loss, the intensity and kind of emotion that is challenging. What we also face is a, a kind of disorientation, a loss of the familiar, a loss of the paths that we usually walk, uh, a loss of habitual patterns of thought, uh, activities, the world no longer appears significant and elicits actions in the way it once did. So part of the difficulty in articulating grief is, um, regardless of the, the specifics of one's relationship with a person, when we're close to someone, that person's not just an object in our world, not akin to a special thing that we care about. That person, insofar as we relate to them, is also a condition for our world, for the sustenance of our world, for all of these patterns, this map, as you put it, to, to mm. hold together. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and and I and I suppose stepping on from that, I wanted to ask you about this this phrase of you talk about one of the core reasons for writing the book of of um, grief being an inherently puzzling part of mm. human experience. So I suppose we could keep that that visual image in play of that map and kind of imagine mm. it now being a jigsaw puzzle that's that's been kind of taken apart you know i was thinking around this analogy of puzzles and that they can be they can start in in many different pieces and you have to figure out what the overall image is or sometimes they are together in one way and have to be taken apart deconstructed or or decoded or unscrambled and so i wanted to ask you more around that that sense you know you named before that deep disorientation and and i think the the puzzling nature of grief, I was really drawn to that. So, you know, could you share with us some reflections or, or maybe learnings? Cause the, the, the book is based on, on a, you know, a large number of surveys that people, people responded. So you've kind of got a, a lot of um, people's reflections there. Yes. I mean, when I was, when I refer to grief as puzzling, I suppose I was thinking of it as specifically philosophically problematic. So grief poses questions that can't be answered simply by obtaining the required information. It seems to be conceptually confusing or com metaphysically confusing, if you like, you know, confusing mm -hmm. in very, very basic ways. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a further distinction here to be drawn between the kind of puzzles that would fascinate philosophers principally, but not bother the rest of us. Um, and, and puzzles that actually strike those who are grieving, puzzles that they have to confront and negotiate. So I mean, let me give you an example that falls more towards the philosophical side of things. So as a philosopher, one might say, well, there's a lot of research on emotional episodes, such as feeling afraid of the dog or happy that it's your birthday. Um, and there's also the acknowledgement of long term moods, which are more generalized and seem to persist, unlike emotional episodes. But grief doesn't seem to be an episode uh, or a mood. If anything, it's a dynamic, temporally extended process, enveloping all manner of emotions, feelings, thoughts, memories, and so forth. But then the philosopher scratches their head and raises the question, well, 
you know, why, why isn't it just an assortment of different things? What unifies all of that? What makes it, how can we refer to the whole as grief rather than just saying, well, here's some sadness, here's a bit of nostalgia, here's some disorientation. Mm-hmm. And then um, one might turn to a remark from Wittgenstein who says, well, while you can feel sort of moment, momentarily afraid or momentarily angry, uh, feeling intense grief for a second or two just doesn't seem coherent. It doesn't make sense. You can't imagine somebody feeling profound grief for a split second and dusting themselves off and carrying on business as usual, no problems. So, so why is that? So it seems that grief has to be long term. And yet at the same time, it encompasses so many different things and it's broken by sleep and by distractions and times when one doesn't, isn't um, aware in a, in a salient way of of one's loss. So, so this is one of the questions I try to address from a philosophical perspective. And very briefly, what I suggest is that grief is a process that is unified over time to the extent that it involves engaging with a unified disturbance of one's life structure one's world, one's self, one's relations with others. Um, At the same time, though, I think one of the things that makes grief interesting for a philosopher is that those who suffer bereavement are confronted with philosophical issues. How, How do I begin to comprehend this? How do I understand what's happening to me? How do I make sense of this? And a lot of this relates to the disorientation that we've already discussed. So let me give you just three examples of things that people find utterly puzzling. One is, especially in the early stages of grief, there's this disconnection between knowing that something has happened. I know that this person is dead. I know that it's true. None of these things apply anymore. You can say, you know, I'm 100% sure this has happened. And yet it seems utterly impossible, unfathomable, unfathomable dreamlike. It's as though I'm an actor on a stage. What, me? This is ridiculous. This can't have happened. So how can you believe something with full conviction and yet find it utterly unbelievable? And something else which also adds to the difficulties in articulating grief is that for many people there's an all-enveloping sense of disconnection from the world. People talk about being pulled out of the world and left in some kind of solitary grief bubble where you sit there in this strange alternate space and time as the consensus world goes past you, seemingly elsewhere. So what does this sense of disconnection or dissociation consist of? And another problem is people talk in various ways about how their own sense of self has been affected by bereavement. So people will say, I died with them or I can't explain, it's like a part of myself has gone. It really is like losing a limb, suffering an amputation. This isn't just an analogy. These aren't just metaphors. You know, It really is like part of me has gone. Um, people will say, I'm not the same person anymore. I can't be the same person. I look into the future and I realize I can no longer be me. Um, and so the question arises, how, how do we make sense of all of this and I think a great deal of it has to do with this this sense of disorientation so the world that we ordinarily take for granted is not some neutral objective manifold that we stare at in a detached manner and occasionally act upon rather we're practically immersed in the interpersonal and social world throughout the course of our lives Um, and when we encounter our surroundings, things don't appear neutral, and then we decide to act. The world pulls us in, it elicits actions, it provides, as we said earlier, a kind of map for our activities. And that's because things appear significant to us in various ways, they matter in various ways. Right now, the screen that I'm looking at matters to me, whereas the dust that I haven't cleaned up for ages at the back of my desk is inconsequential. The world shows up as a, as a pattern of interrelated significant entities and events and situations. Um, And so much of this can depend upon the possibility of relating to a particular person. Um, Following a marital bereavement, um, one may, so spousal bereavement, one may 
return to one's home. Those are still our shoes. That's still the sofa where we sit. That's still our kitchen. That's still our bed. That's still the study where he worked. All of these things appear significant in the ways they did. So you can say, yes, I believe that that person's died. I know that that person's died. And yet the, the whole world is still filled with possibilities for relating to them. That doesn't change instantly. That takes time. One needs to re-engage with the world, to reconfigure the world. And the other phenomena I mentioned are related to this as well. So a relationship with a particular person, a parent, a partner, a child, a friend, can be integral to one's possibilities for engaging with and relating to wider situations. So without that person, wider possibilities for interaction no longer apply. One's cut off from various things. Um, you know, we no longer go out with our friends. This is no longer, this can no, no longer be this place where we all relate to each other in these ways. Um, a relation, the, the loss of a relationship can pr profoundly disrupt, if you like, the, 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 the strings that bind one to a larger world. And as for the sense of self, who we are, what makes us distinctive as a person, our projects, our values, our commitments, the organised possibilities through which we meet the future, all of that can depend in so many ways on our relations with others, on being a parent, a daughter or son, a partner, on having these friends. So who, who one is, the whole integrity and organization of one's own distinctiveness can be profoundly disrupted. And these are just some of the things that people face after some you know, certain kinds of bereavements that can leave one feeling disoriented and with this profoundly puzzled. Sorry, that was a very long answer. No, no, it's, it's absolutely fine. I, I, there's so many piece it puzzle pieces <laughs> in the in the in the discussion i was just i'm really struck i think by this the way in which you know as you're describing it it, it reminds me i think tom attig maybe talks about mm. you know grief being this process of relearning the world but we could step on from that and say it's not relearning how to how to navigate a world it's not like you've been picked up from one world and taken to a new one where you know, like if you travel to a new city and you don't know your way around, you, you fully need to be oriented by somebody else. You need GPS or you need to ask directions at every street corner to try and find your way. It's not like that, though, I, I think, because people are, uh, it's almost like people have arrived as, as new experiences of that world they already know. So the word that kept coming for me was uncanny. You know, mm. or, or truly in the truly weird sense. I don't mean weird in like a bit, a bit countercultural. I mean like weird in the uncanny sense of, I know this place, but some fundamental things have changed. You know, there's been a number of, mm. I suppose, uh, I'm trying to think how to describe them, but like TV shows that have elements of the supernatural, for example, where this happens, where some event takes place, and then. It's, it's the everyday world, except it's not. Some fundamental, like, core foundational things have shifted, which mean now relating in the world is very different. You know, similarly, I think of The Matrix or there's an old 80s film, yeah. They Live, which is based on glasses, you know, where it seems the perception of the world you're already in. So there's a familiarity and at the same time an unrecognizability. Um, is, this, is this a type of thing that, that you've, you know, found people – to discuss or, or, you know, resonates in some way? Yes. And I think, you know, as you mentioned, Tom Attig's term, relearning the world is very helpful. And I think that that conveys wonderfully the way in which bereavement challenges one, not just to come to terms with something specific, but to, to, to reorganize a whole, you know, all these aspects of one's life. It's not just about one, one's emotional life, one's relations with others, everything may have to change. And as you've also mentioned, it's important to recognise this isn't just about moving from an old world to a new world where things are different. Rather, again, the theme we keep coming back to is a kind of indeterminacy, disorientation, a breakdown of structure. There's the world in between, a place that lacks this, this kind of familiarity. Um, 
I think your use of the term uncanny is entirely appropriate if we think of the uncanny in terms of a, an experienced tension between something that is utterly familiar and yet wholly unfamiliar at the same time. Mm -hmm. And this can affect various, that this can apply to various aspects of one's life. Something, something can seem uncanny when the situation as a whole can seem uncanny. The funeral, mm -hmm could seem uncanny, but objects as well, the reconfiguration of one's memories. Um, and I don't, I haven't come across people using the word uncanny that often, though I may well go and look more carefully now, but people talk a lot about the, you know, the utter strangeness of it, the, 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 the weirdness, and also how this is unexpected. Whatever you might imagine um, the experience of, of, of grief to feel like, even those who anticipate a bereavement for a, a long time are often taken aback by the strangeness of it, mm. the utter unfamiliarity and bizarreness mm. of one's situation. Yeah, it's it's true. And I, I suppose I, I want to follow that thread by linking in something you, you talked about earlier in terms of the the puzzles or the questions that a philosopher might might ask in relationship to grief around how people's relationship to their own internal experience but also the world around them shifts mm. um, and changes you know you you've talked about how um you know that that grief alters the human encounter with both the living and the dead you know in a in a in a perceived and an experiential way and and you draw a lot in the book on on um, on phenomenology as a as a frame for exploring this and so i wanted to ask you to talk about what you feel you know the approach of phenomenology you know what does that bring that's different to say other more um either clinical or you know other approaches to you know grief literature it's it's not it's not uh, struck me as a very common uh, way of of exploring grief um so i just i wanted to ask you to to talk about that Okay. I mean, I think, first of all, we probably need to, to distinguish three different definitions of phenomenology. So within philosophy, sorry, physicists talk about it as well, but that's another thing. Uh, within philosophy, yeah. phenom phenomenology could just be a synonym for experience or, or consciousness. So you could talk about, you know, the phenomenology of perception rather than the experience of perception. However, we can also use the term phenomenology to refer to the study of experience and we can use it in a more specific way still to refer to a, dis a certain philosophical tradition dedicated to the study of experience. And that tradition includes philosophers such as um, Edmund Husserl, the founder of phenomenology, Martin Heidegger, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, Jean-Paul Sartre, and in particular, I, I engage with the work of Maurice Meliponti in my book, Grief Worlds. So why one might ask, would it be helpful to draw on that tradition specifically when trying to engage with grief? Well, first of all, you can look at the kinds of analyses and descriptions that phenomenologists offer. So much of this work is concerned with themes like uh, time, the sense of self, space, the body, uh, interpersonal experience, and, and so forth. So we could draw on particular insights but there's also something specific to phenomenological method. In various different ways, phenomenologists all emphasize that to really study and describe the structure of experience, you have to step back from what's ordinarily taken for granted. So experience isn't just a matter of feeling this or seeing that, or thinking something or remembering something. All of this goes on within the context of a pre-established experiential world, which we take for granted as shared. And that in itself is a phenomenological achievement. It's an aspect of our experience, but it's something that's ordinarily overlooked. We already find ourselves in the world when we start to reflect on experience. And there's the tendency to think about what's going on in here, as opposed to in, in somebody else's head, or to focus on specific experiences such as my perception of this drinking glass, uh, the sound of this pen as it hits the table, mm. and so forth. 
And what phenomenologists all do in different ways is try and sort of burrow down and get at this presupposed world. And I think if we are to understand experiences of grief, we need something like this perspective because grief disrupts a world, a life, a sense of oneself, one's body, space, time, relations with others. There are all aspects of experience that are ordinarily presupposed. But I also think there are other um, illuminating analogies here. So grief can be like phenomenological exploration in certain ways. Um, in disrupting the familiar world, grief can disclose what's ordinarily taken for granted. So there are certain parallels between the structure of grief and phenomenological method, although that shouldn't be pursued too far, I don't, I don't think. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. And there's a, there's a way in which, you know, phenomenology is is exploring the, I heard it described recently, is that the what it's likeness, you know, mm. to, be, to be in the world. Um, particularly a world where the, where temporality, there where there's such finite limitations. I think time is a is a really relevant example in relation to grief. Mm. Um, that as soon as we start to experience that thing which we typically only engage with, but you know we set the alarm clock before we go to bed, we wake up, kind of structure our lives according to a time. But the minute that we start to more deeply explore this, um, I'm talking kind of everyday, uh, everyday experience, I suppose. Um, there's, there is a vastness that opens up, but also, a, a um, a strangeness to, oh, all of that, these whole, you know, worlds of possibilities of mm. thought and experience exist again, like you say, that are so often taken for granted. Um, there's something that strikes me in, in this sort of an approach to grief that, that seems to be I'm trying not to bring a hierarchical distinction, but it's something around valuing um, the experience of the person who is grieving, you know, rather than them coming to, for example, uh, a clinical expert to say, well, this is what you're experiencing, this is why, and this is, you know, kind of for answers, as, as it were, or for explanation. There seems to be more of a curiosity about eliciting what is the nature of that experience. Like, it mm. seems a more, a more, a more curious um way to to wonder about this puzzle of grief yes and i i suppose i've tried to think about this in a dialogical way where a philosophical approach can illuminate aspects of people's experiences while grieving and vice mm -hmm. versa so it goes both ways but i suppose we um you're thinking also of, of in practice when we engage with people's grief, mm. um, where, how this might relate to how we do so. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, we can distinguish between the roles of friends, relatives, and people playing you know, various formal support roles. Um, and I think one, one thing I would certainly not want to do is suggest that we can provide an account of grief that we then impose on someone who's grieving and then politely explain to them what they're experiencing, and then they feel better. That, that would be absolutely disastrous. And I think what's something that really needs to be recognised is the particularity of grief, the nature of the relationship, the circumstances of the bereavement, the structure of that person's life, uh, the losses they may have experienced in the past, their current relations with others. Um, there are so many different things that are interconnected their own tendencies towards self-interpretation, whether they want their grief experience to be understood in certain ways. So that, that there are so many differences between people's experiences of grief and also what people need. So, you know, you know that's why one should never say, I know exactly how you feel. I lost my parent as well, uh, which people can find sort of quite upsetting, intrusive and unempathic. And what the way I think of my own work is it can provide an interpretive framework that will help you with a dialogic, dialogical engagement with somebody else's grief. Mm -hmm. But that kind of dialogue, um, it's, it's not about getting into somebody else's head. It's not about experiencing what they experience and then telling them that you've managed to do so. What's required, I think, is a kind of openness to someone's experience, empathy, essentially involves a sort of curiosity 
it's not about duplicating what people experience, but having sustaining a sense of connection with them that allows them to articulate it and allows both of you to make sense of it together. So I think much more of it as a kind of collaborative interpretive project between people. I don't know whether that is fair enough or whether that really addresses what you were pressing at. Yeah, I was just gonna I just those words really struck a collaborative interpretive project between people. And you talked before before about it being, yeah, this this dialogue. And there there's something there which I think puts it right back at the heart of, you know, some of the most puzzling puzzling questions that we hold in life and that um grief grief in itself is not a problem to be fixed you know is a, is a is a commonly used phrase or kind of it's not a it's it's questions to be lived with um you know and so in that process having some companionship whether that's in the everyday but like you say between friends and people you know or or if that's in a in a context where professionals are being alongside other people it seems to have a real value in in um in the in being a different a different type of approach than for example here's what you should expect to experience in 10 dot points on a on a tip mm. sheet and <laughs> here's how long it will last and and you know kind of off you go i think um, something people sometimes people often report is saying that is this normal should i be experiencing this uh mm. I, you know is this not right so i think one has to be very careful about prescribing ways of grieving and there's the worry that uh, emotional responses to one's grief can exacerbate the distress, the suffering. Mm -hmm. So I think putting people at ease and saying, you know, yes, there is tremendous diversity to grief is very important. Of course, I, I wouldn't want to deny, though, that there are forms of grief where you know, clinical support is appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's very, very challenging. Um, to, to distinguish what we might regard as as typical uh, from from what may require clinical intervention, but maybe I shouldn't introduce that topic because it's a huge and difficult topic. I'm not sure. It, it is huge, but I also I suppose I'm thinking about it precisely in those terms. That even mm. in clinical support, the idea of approaching from from a a collaborative and dialogical perspective, I think, is one that I'm very interested in as well. I think it's 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 in that sense. I realise the community and clinical space would be very different uh, types and dynamics of 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 how those conversations take place. Mm. But I think the there could be uh, some some similarities of approach, particularly linking back, I suppose, to us talking about inquiring about the nature of what that experience is like. You know, and that you said it that, sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry. I, I, I think that's right. And I've, when it comes to sort of uh, diagnostic categories, such as the currently in the, the, the category prolonged grief disorder, which is now um, included in both the ICD and DSM psychiatric classification manuals, I, I don't explicitly endorse these diagnostic categories and neither do I challenge them. Um, rather, what I've tried to do is look at what might distinguish forms of experience compatible with those diagnoses. And the one thing I have found is that we really need to think of this much more in social and relational terms than just in terms of something going on in the individual that needs to be addressed. The course of grief, how it unfolds over time, how it's structured, has so much to do with our ongoing social relations and our interactions with others. We might say that grief is not just internally regulated, but grief is regulated by um, interactions with our social environments. So the ways in which we relate to others, the kinds of dialogue we have may be integral to, to how grief unfolds. Yeah, I think that's a really good, a really good point. Um, I'm, I am restraining from going towards the the DSM and diagnostic conversation. That would take a, that would be another episode. But I think that I really value you highlighting this this importance of the social and relational context of grief, rather than this being something that's pointed at an individual as being solely within them. Um, and that will make a smooth segue <laughs> to our next question, um, which which is around. I was really interested in the book that you devoted a couple of chapters to um, the the experience of um, 
of bereaved individuals being in relationship with the person who's died. So this is not, uh, you know, typically given as much attention in, at least in Western, um, you know, kind of grief literature or academia, you know, how the living continue to relate to the dead. And yet this has been, I think, you know, if we look back over history, this has certainly been, been a very prevalent part of people's uh, attempt to to uh, comprehend and articulate grief, um, you know, the, the presence of, of how the dead are gone or with us mm. or it's in some other way. Um, so you've talked in the, in, in the book um, about how, you know, bereaved individuals don't experience the dead as, as something separate and, and only in the past, but that in an ongoing and present way, you talk about this concept of a present absence. And I wanted to ask you to to unpack that a bit more, um, you know, in relation to people's experience of grief. Yes, there's, there's so much to say here. So I think as, as the background, it's, it's worth mentioning the continuing bonds approach to bereavement um, mm -hmm. pioneered by Dennis Klass and various others. So the, the, the story goes that in certain cultures, at least often referred to as Western cultures, uh, grief has been conceptualized in terms of letting go or severing bonds with those who died. But then if we look elsewhere, we find an emphasis not on letting go, but on changing one's relationship with a person. So you don't stop relating to someone when they die, rather you have to relate to them in different ways. Um, and I think this, one has to be careful not to oversimplify things here. First of all, contrast between Eastern and Western cultures are, I think things are more nuanced than that. Uh, but also the distinction between maintaining a bond and letting go is not, it's not an either or distinction. We may let go of certain aspects of our attachments or relationships and then retain or reshape others. And again, there's no, there's no right way of doing this. Um, people describe all manner of different ways of continuing to relate to those who've died. Some will think of it primarily in terms of memory. There may be an emphasis on artifacts or places. Others will report speaking to those who've died. Others will, some people report receiving a response, which may be a verbal response or more of a feeling. So many people talk about signs and symbols and communications. Sometimes the appearance of certain animals, like a bird, in a certain place. But also there are a variety of more immediate perception-like experiences of the presence or absence of the person who's died. Okay. So the presence of absence, I think, is actually something quite ubiquitous in our lives and often mundane. So uh, to give me an experience of present absence, all my wife needs to do now is go and remove the television from the lounge. And when I come down, I'll be confronted by an immediate sense of something is missing. And these experiences can be localized or less localized. So it might seem you might be confronted in, with, with the sense of something being absent from a particular location. I think of when you reach into your pocket to get your wallet or your phone and it's not there. But then you can have more pervasive experiences of absence. I think it was uh, C.S. Lewis, if I quote this correctly, wrote, her absence is like the sky spread over everything. It's not just that she's not there, but the lack of someone is very much present. And we can think of this partly in terms of expectations that are negated or unfulfilled and organizations of one's surrounding that point to someone's potential presence and yet that person isn't there. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are a range of experiences where people do experience the person who's died as somehow present. And something I challenge here is the tendency to refer to these in terms of hallucinations, where we can think of a hallucination as a perception-like experience uh, of something that is not actually there, so it seems to be wrong, mistaken, perhaps pathological, and referring just to our, our, our conversation just now, this may relate to perceptions of grief as somehow pathological. You know, I just had this feeling that he was lying in bed next to me. Is, is that normal? Has something gone wrong? 
And people, mm. at least in, in certain circumstances, can be very uncomfortable about describing these experiences. Mm. But again, in the majority of cases, they, they seem to be quite benign um, and certainly not associated only with especially problematic forms of grief. But also I think a lot of them are misconstrued. So when people say, you know, I see, I, I see her, uh, I, I, I heard him, I felt his presence, they're often not talking about something that's like seeing something in particular. You, know, you can see him standing there in that precise location looking this way. Rather, there, there's a kind of feeling of presence that is less specific and quite difficult to describe. And the way I've tried to interpret that, just to allude to it very briefly, is to look at the ways we feel when we're with other people. Being with a particular person shapes how we experience our surroundings in this dynamic, ongoing way. Uh, being in a particular place with a particular person can be different from being there with someone else or being on one's own. It offers different possibilities. Things stand out in different ways. Things draw you in in different ways. So another person contributes to this ongoing atmosphere. It feels like something to be with them mm -hmm. on this ongoing, in this ongoing way. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of experiences take this form. One has the feeling of being with them. And it's not mm -hmm. clear that that's some kind of mistaken perceptual, you know, a, a perception-like experience that is in fact misleading is not to be construed in, the, in that way. And also in talking about hallucinations, it's very important to recognise that this really jars with many people's self-interpretations. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, I, I, I believe that they really were there with me in some way. Yeah, and I wonder, particularly because hallucinations have so much association with pathology, um, you know, in, in, in the context you were you were speaking about them that, that no wonder that's jarring if people are it seems much more of a a complex intersection between a number of things including mm. feeling emotion thought but also the imagination the idea of yes. I, I can see them standing there or I, I feel they are with me when i'm in this place that we were together um you know and then stepping on from that again there can be various cultural layers of either meaning or um you know uh, non non material experiences or spiritual experiences that people may also attribute, you know, kind of multiple layers. So yeah, it, it seems that hallucinations certainly. Uh, yeah. I uh, think you're absolutely right mm -hmm. there, and and these, you know, what you've just said is really important. That you don't have a singular experience; it's embedded in your own interpretation, shared interpretations, a cultural context often a more specifically religious context. So you have these really complicated quite nuanced experiences that need to be described very carefully. And I think this is why a lot of the continuing bonds literature is really great. It, it emphasizes the diversity and the complexity of these experiences of presence in grief. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware that I think the very first thing you said was the longer that you have spent researching and exploring um, grief, you've realized the, the kind of growing complexity of it. And that's where we've kind of landed as we as we come to close as well. Yeah. So I think that's it's certainly a, a yeah a a very important and central part mm -hmm. of this. But I really want to thank you for helping you know in this conversation. I think to to expand you know is a reminder of the expansion of the vastness of the um, the many layeredness and the complexity mm -hmm. of this puzzling um, puzzling thing we know as grief. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you.